Hello, I'm Tom Long and welcome to Island Meditations. Today it is cold and windy here in the southeast of the United States and uh, I'm guessing that you folks up in uh, the area of Buffalo, New York, for example, are going to feel very sorry for me. But whether you are in New York or you are down here in the south or out in uh, Southern California, wherever the Lord may find you this fine day, um, I suspect that there's a certain amount of warmth in your household and among your friends and family because we are coming up on the second Sunday of Advent, which uh, means that Christmas is close by as we look at Philippians chapter one. So let's reflect on what God's word says as we walk together in the beauty of his creation. Advent is the season of the church calendar that seems to flit by in a blink of an eye. It's been said that time flies when you're having fun and Advent is often a fun-filled season, especially for those of us with children or grandchildren that are looking forward to the coming of Santa Claus and the gifts he will bring. For many kids, it is an easy time to be hopeful, but sometimes the waiting is even harder for those who are waiting for what they expect to be good things. As we get older, hope may become harder to hold on to as well. We've experienced false hope, hope in outcomes that never happened, a promotion, a pregnancy, a relationship, a diagnostic test. The closer we are to hope being realized, the less tempted we are to give in to apathy or despair. But when writing his letter to the Philippians, Paul had no idea how long he would be held in Roman detention. He wore chains, as he said, for Christ. He actually wasn't even sure that he would be released from imprisonment. There was a real chance that the Romans would execute him for proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul was a devout Jew who had become a committed Christian. He was well aware of the suffering of his people and the many times that it looked as though God would not save them, but God always did. He saved them from slavery in Egypt. He saved them from captivity in Assyria and in Babylon. And when the day of Christ comes, Christians will be saved from those earthly and spiritual forces that oppose us today. Today, we like Paul and the Philippians, continue to wait for Christ's return. So I think what Paul says to them about how to wait can be applied to myself as well. But before he hands out advice, he gives an amazing example of Christian waiting. Our reading begins with Paul saying, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Paul tells the church that they are in his thoughts and in his prayers of intercession, that God will meet their needs. But let's just take a second to reflect on this prisoner's attitude. He remembers them with thanks. He intercedes for them with joy. His body is in literal chains, but his heart is full of thanks and full of joy. There are those that mock Christians for telling them that they are in our thoughts and prayers. I get that. Talk without the walk can seem like a way to hide behind religion and avoid taking action that will get us on the bad side of our friends or our family. But Paul's thanks, his joy, sprang from his hope, his confidence that, quote, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus, unquote. And what is it that Paul is praying for them? It's very similar to his prayer for the Thessalonians. And this is my prayer, he said, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. 
He wants the church to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. As a devout Jew, Paul knew that to be pure was an act of grace on the part of God. David, the king, who committed adultery and had her husband killed in battle, that David's prayer of repentance included these words, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. It is God who by his grace purifies our hearts. That same David made it clear that to be blameless was likewise an act of God's grace. In Psalm 19 verses 12 and 13 he said, But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. Paul says that like a pure heart or a blameless soul, the fruit of righteousness, quote, comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God, unquote. Whatever chains we may be wearing, whatever the hope that has yet to be realized, Paul is confident that God will complete his work of grace in each of us. On the day of Christ's return, or when we see Jesus face to face in heaven, our hope will come to us, just as Jesus came to fulfill the promise of the long-awaited Messiah. I remember the excitement on the faces of my children as they looked forward to what Santa Claus would bring them. I can't tell you what a joy it was to see their anticipation, knowing that they would not be disappointed. I wonder if love and joy wells up in the heart of Christ when he sees us eagerly longing for his return, for God's kingdom of love, of justice, of mercy, and of peace to be on earth as it is in heaven. May this Advent season be a time in which our hope, our gratitude, our joy, our love of God and our neighbor is refreshed and renewed. Merry Christmas.